Okay, so I guess I guess we'll just begin, and if people come in, they come in, and if not, then it'll be us, and we'll just have a party by ourselves. So, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to introduce the program. Um, this is Valley Children's Hospital Epilepsy Support Program, and we are joining with um, our awesome program here at Disneyland Awareness Days um, to really just bring you some education and some information today. And our first speaker that we have present with us is our wonderful Dr. Julia Sharma, and she's been with Valley Children's now as our, one of our neurosurgeons for since 2018, I believe. And um, without her support, there is no way that this program would be up and going. She is an avid um, advocate for epilepsy surgery and knows everything and anything. Um, they can answer your questions regarding um, epilepsy surgery and if a certain type is good for you. And um, so I'm just gonna introduce Dr. Sharma and let her go ahead and start. And then questions, anything, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourselves and we will go from there. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Caitlin, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, like uh, I was introduced, I'm Dr. Sharma. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at Valley Children's, um, and I'm also the program director for surgical epilepsy. So epilepsy is very near and dear to my heart, um, and I'm very pleased to give you this little presentation just as a general overview of um, the work that we do and why we do it. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, and how does that look, Caitlin? Okay, great. All right, so here we are. So this um, is my presentation called Surgical Treatment of Pediatric Epilepsy. Um, very broad, and uh, we'll just kind of start off with, you know, very basically talking about epilepsy in general. So what is epilepsy? So epilepsy is a sudden um, one episode or recurrent episodes of sensory disturbance uh, or loss of consciousness um, or convulsions that are associated with abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Now, the frequency can range from many in a day. Um, you know, sometimes even patients come to me, they're having 15, 20 seizures in a day, um, or it could be just a couple per year. Um, and the severity could be just momentary confusion or a brief staring episode to whole body convulsions, loss of consciousness and loss of bladder control. Um, the seizures themselves are caused by abnormal discharges of electrical activity. And the brain, the way that it communicates the brain cells with each other is through electrical activity. Um, and this is kind of that process, but gone awry. Um, and so this can be caused by a number of things, tumors, scarring, developmental abnormalities, um, a focus of irritation, and it can be focal, meaning it's coming from a specific part in the brain or generalized where kind of it starts everywhere all at once. And that becomes really important on how we can treat epilepsy um, because really that splits things into very two different categories on, on how to treat. So then the next question, what, why treat? Well, uh, first of all, it does interfere with development. Um, as you can imagine, when, when these neurons are talking to each other using this electrical activity, when you have this abnormal discharge, it disrupts that process. So it disrupts learning, it disrupts um, you know, how clearly people are thinking. Um, and then when you treat with medications, that themselves can have abnormal side effects. So you can feel some slowing, um, you know, coordination, balance changes. Some people report memory problems, weight gain, anemia, immunosuppressant, personality changes. And while our neurologists are really good at you know, trying to figure out what medication is best for one particular patient that, you know, to minimize these side effects, a lot of patients are still experiencing this. Um, beyond that, um, you never know when you're going to have a seizure. So it's kind of like, you know, living with a time bomb. You, you're in the middle of making dinner um, and then all of a sudden it hits and you're on the floor. Um, and that's very disruptive um, for our kids, you know, especially the ones that are approaching 16, you know, they want to get a driver's license. And if they're having uncontrolled seizures, they can't. Um, they can't live alone. They can't swim alone. You know, all, all of these things, because you really don't know when it's going to happen. 
Um, on top of that, um, you know, in terms of the family, you know, it's very much a disease where, yes, it affects the patient, the child, but the whole family is involved, you know, trying to keep it, keep it things safe. Um, you know, you may need to go to the emergency department for uncontrolled seizures. There's medical bills. There's the stigma of it all. You know, you're, you're at work and you have a seizure. You're at school, you have a seizure. Um, and then even more serious is um, something called SUDEP which is sudden unexpected death from epilepsy, um, where um, patients can actually die from their seizures. And the risk of this is estimated to be about one per 100 in patients with symptomatic seizures, and then one in 1,000 for idiopathic seizures. So, so this is a real risk, you know, and, and this um, is kind of a, a good reason why we really want to treat these, why we want to get the seizures under control. So overall, two to four million people in the US have epilepsy. In the Central Valley, we have about 1.2 million kids living here. And with our statistics that we know, the frequency of epilepsy, that means that 12,000 kids in the Valley are living with epilepsy. And we know that a third of those are gonna be refractory to medical therapy, meaning that even if they're on medicines, they still continue to have seizures. So that's a lot, that's, that's 4,000 children. Um, by far, the bulk of seizure disorders are controlled with medication, and it's really only a minority that are surgical cases, probably about 1%. However, surgery for epilepsy is still underutilized. So of those 1%, only 1% of those are actually getting the surgery that they need, this potentially curative surgery. Um, and, you know, we have to ask ourselves why. And I think that there's a number of reasons. Um, for one thing, I think it's scary. It's scary for the patients, it's scary for the families to kind of go down that path. Um, and, um, you know, brain surgery sounds scary. I, I know it does. Um, and so that's why, you know, we're trying to get some education out um, with these types of events to share with you some stories, um, you know, of our successes and that we are doing this and we're doing it safely and that we're doing it and we're really making a difference in people's lives. So um, when we have our right candidate, so when we've you know, decided, okay, you're a candidate for surgery, there is a marked advantage of surgery over medical treatment alone. Um, in terms of seizure control, um, once you've failed two or three medications, the chance of you going on to be seizure-free with another medicine is very, very low. Whereas, you know, often with surgery, we can give some pretty good chances of cure. And, you know, often that's even as high as 80% chance of cure. Um, but the key to this is, is identifying who is a good candidate. And that's where we rely on our whole team. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of how we work as a team to find out who is a good candidate. So first of all, you have to be drug resistant. If your seizures are well controlled on medicine, by and large, we will say stay with the medication. As long as you're not having terrible side effects, um, that is a great way to control epilepsy. Um, but if you become drug resistant, meaning you have failed two different medications and you're still having greater than one seizure per month. Um, now that's kind of a soft definition. You know, you, you may have one seizure every month and a half or two months, um, but if they're very large seizures, they're dangerous seizures, you could become a candidate as well. But in general, if you've, not, if you've done all your medications, you're compliant with your medicines, um, you've been on multiple and you're still having seizures, um, you should be evaluated. And the whole key to epilepsy surgery is that we need to determine where the seizures are coming from. You know, surgery, you know, you do an operation, you wanna know where your, your focus is. Um, and if it's all in one spot, there's a chance that we could remove that area um, and actually get rid of the seizures because that's where they're coming from. And so we use all these different things to try and figure out where they're coming from, MRI, so an imaging study of the brain to see if we can see an abnormality. Um, we use EEGs where you have the stickers on your head, recording for electrical activity, something called PET, something called SPECT. Uh, and I'll go into those. There's a kind of specialized tests um, in the slides to come. So finding the seizure focus. So this is kind of where we become little detectives. You know, we're, we're looking, we're, we're trying to put all the information together, we're gathering clues. Um, and, and these are some of the things where that can cause seizures, where we see an abnormality on MRI. So um, can you see my pointer here? 
Yeah, great. So um, I've got some arrows because when you're first looking at these scans, it's not really all that obvious. Um, but this is one of our patients. Um, this is a child that had an area of cortical dysplasia. So it's basically just when the brain forms, it forms in this slightly abnormal way where the organization of the brain in that area is abnormal. And we know that those areas um, can generate seizures. And so this is it here. I'm kind of tracing it out. You can see it's a little bit brighter than the surrounding brain. And here, this is a different view kind of looking straight on. And again, you can see this kind of wedge shape where you see this brighter area of the brain. And if you compare it to the other side, you really don't see that on the other side. Um, when we see areas like this, we wanna make sure um, that it makes sense. So if this area, and it's kind of close to what we'd call the motor cortex um, on the right, so that controls movement on the left side of the body. So if I was to guess, and, and actually that was true for this child, um, the seizure would probably look like twitching or abnormal movements on that left side of the face because it kind of activates that part of the brain that controls um, that in a normal situation. So this would be cortical dysplasia as a cause of epilepsy. Um, this one, a little more subtle, but actually one of our more common causes of epilepsy is um, something called mesial temporal sclerosis or MTS, um, but this is temporal lobe epilepsy. So um, very, very common. And you can see again here with the arrow, this is the hippocampus. So normally responsible for memory, um, pretty deep in the brain, in the temporal lobe. And this tends to be a very common area where seizures can come from. Um, this is again one of my patients and he was treated with a temporal lobectomy where we removed part of the temporal lobe, including this hippocampus. Um, he's now seizure free uh, four months out from surgery. This here is another MRI, another different child. This is a cavernoma, this little kind of bubbly appearance of um, this area in the brain. And that's actually a vascular malformation. So it's an abnormal um, kind of tangle of veins um, and it can cause irritation around it um, in the surrounding brain and generate seizures. Um, again, I've, uh, I have a recent case and it wasn't this one in particular, but um, I have a recent case. So she had, again, it was close to the motor strip actually. So she had seizures where her sister described, she did a, an Elvis smile. One, one part of the face was kind of going up in a, in a gribus because that was being activated by the seizures. Again, it made sense because her um, cavernoma was right close to the motor strip and we managed to take it out. Um, she's also seizure free at this point. Uh, over here, um, bottom left, we have a low grade tumor in the temporal lobe again. Temporal lobe is one of the most common areas for epilepsy to be in um, and uh, removed this, um, this patient is seizure free. This is uh, another one, something called a hemispherectomy or hemispherotomy. Um, you can see that half of the brain is kind of shrunken. Um, this is a condition called Sturge-Weber where you have these abnormal vessels that form on the surface of the brain. And um, over time, um, that can interfere with the functioning on that side of the brain and cause it to shrink and cause it to generate seizures. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about this, but this is probably one of the longest and, and most extreme surgeries that I do because it involves disconnecting a whole half of the brain. Um, and actually, when you pick the right candidate for this surgery, it can work very, very well. And I'm very pleased to say that this patient is one of our first patients um, that we um, did this operation on here at Valley Children's very soon after I started um, and she is seizure free now. Um, it'll be about three years out. Um, over here, uh, we've got a few little dark areas that the arrows are pointing to. Um, that's a whole other, it's another situation entirely. So this is a patient with uh, tuberous sclerosis. So it's a, usually a genetic disease or a genetic component. And you get these tubers, these kind of hard kind of areas of the brain that can become calcified. There's calcium in them and they tend to generate seizures. Um, and so this patient, um, first off, had multiple of these areas. We had to first figure out which one was responsible. Um, and then I was able to put a laser into that area, burn it um, and get rid of those seizures for this young child. So that's kind of a general overview and I'll go into each one specifically. So EEG, so this is one um, 
you know, very, very broad. Pretty much everybody that has seizures is going to have this at some point. I'm sure, you know, people in the audience are saying, yeah, I've had that, you know, or my child has had that. And it's just these little stickers, these electrodes on the head, on the scalp, and they're trying to record where the seizures are coming from. This is a very good first step. Um, but sometimes, you know, it, it actually doesn't give us enough information, um, but it certainly helps us out. It's again, one of those pieces where we're, we're trying to put all the clues together and figure it out. Um, and sometimes it might tell us, okay, it's, it's the right side or the left side, but we don't know where. Um, and that's where the other tests come in to give us that extra information. But um, this is um, for sure kind of the starting point to pretty much any investigation. Um, and, and it's very important because sometimes, you know, we're not sure if things are seizures. Um, this is where the neurologists, you know, are, are really quite key. We want, we want to look at what the seizures look like because that gives us clues as to where they're coming from, what type of seizures they are. And sometimes people will have episodes that we think might be seizures, but that aren't actually seizures at all. Um, for instance, um, you know, you could have a fainting spell from a cardiac issue um, or low blood, blood pressure, um, low blood sugar even. And um, you know, that could look very much like a seizure. Um, and so we wanna capture them. We want to actually be recording from these electrodes while you're having an active seizure. And that way um, we can have it on video, we can see what it looks like and we can see exactly where that activity is coming from. Um, it tells you what type it is because what type, say if you have generalized seizures, they start everywhere all at once. Well, that's usually not going to be somebody that we're going to want to go in and do a focal surgery, resect a certain area of the brain, because it's coming from everywhere. We want to offer surgery when we really think it can make a difference and, and potentially cure. Um, but sometimes we do pick up focal epilepsy. Sometimes we do this and, you know, it shows that there's one area in particular that's very active and we say, okay, well, that warrants further investigation. This person could be a good surgical candidate. And that's where we go through the next steps. So SPECT, so um, not everybody gets this, um, but it's kind of another tool that we have to try and figure out where our seizures are coming from. Um, and it basically relies on the fact that your, your blood is kind of an on, your, your, so your brain is kind of an on-demand kind of organ. So when, when it's got an area that's working hard, it's going to divert more blood there. And so in this situation, you're in hospital, we're watching for seizures. And when we see a seizure, there'll be a nurse or a technician at the bedside that will inject this radionucleotide tracer into the bloodstream. And then because we know that that blood is gonna preferentially go to an area of high activity in the brain and seizures will be an area of high activity, we will see that area light up with this tracer um, when we then do the, um, the scan. And here is kind of an illustration of that. Um, you can see here is interictal or in between seizures where things look pretty symmetric between the right side and the left side. And then we go to the ictal, and this is where we've injected that tracer. And you can see that, you know, and it's all about comparing right to left. Um, when you compare right to left here, and it usually is flipped. So here we see the spotlight up here. And that is very likely the cause of the seizures and where the seizure is coming from. And sometimes this kind of thing gives us even more clues. It allows us to say, okay, well, let's look closer on that area. And then we go back to the MRI and we, we really look, look at that area or we might even do another MRI that has finer cuts in it so that we can see these really fine details. And when we go back, sometimes we will see, okay, well, maybe there is an abnormality there. Uh, similarly, PET scan, positron emission tomography is another tool that we use. And this uses a form of glucose that's actually labeled. And so um, in this one, you don't actually need to be having a seizure uh, when we do the scan. Um, so it's useful in that way. Um, and it relies on the fact that, again, when that area is active, um, it will be using um, not just have more blood flow, but it will be using more glucose, which is kind of your energy source. They'll be using more energy. And so when you're actively seizing, that area will be um, kind of brighter on this, but if you're not seizing, then that area is not usually working properly. And so you will normally see a difference where it's actually um, hypometabolic. You see less activity there in between seizures. And that's what this shows. So the red is kind of 
the um, activity level. Blue would be low activity, red would be high activity. And when you compare the two sides, you can see there's a nice ribbon over here on the surface of the brain. But on this side with the arrow, you don't see a, as much of a nice red ribbon. So that area has decreased activity, and that could very well be where the seizures are coming from in this person. So we do all these tests, right? These are non-invasive tests, and this is a good place to start. But if we do all these tests and we're still unsure, then we might need to take it to the next level. And that's um, when I get involved. So if we have all these stickers or electrodes on the surface of the scalp, maybe we, we know what side it's coming from, but not exactly where. Maybe we've been able to say, okay, we think it's in the temporal lobes. We don't know if it's the right side or the left side. And that's where we need to actually get better quality information. And the types of invasive electrodes that we have um, to use would be subdural. So that's actually, and I'll show you a picture of this, but it's actually placing strips of electrodes directly on the surface of the brain or depths where you actually put an electrode into the brain itself. Um, and um, SEEG is stereo EEG. And this is kind of a newer version of the depth electrodes just because it's so precise. It's actually done using a robot to guide the placement so that we're actually within less than a millimeter of accuracy. So that's very, very precise. It's what makes this a safe procedure to do. And I will talk about that a little bit more as well. So here's some pictures of subdural electrodes. So here's a little cartoon and you can see this is a, a grid which is placed over the surface of the brain. Um, this involves a craniotomy. So we'd have to do an operation to remove a window of bone um, and place this directly on the brain. So this is what the brain looks like when you're looking at it in surgery. You see all the blood vessels and the folds of the brain. And this here is the grid. So it's kind of a flexible plastic grid with a bunch of electrodes in it. And that goes directly on the surface of the brain. And then we close everything up over top. The protective layer of the brain goes over top, skull goes back on loosely, the skin gets closed. And um, in the middle here on the bottom, you can see what the CT scan would look like, where you have all these bright dots on the surface of the brain um, that we're recording from. Um, and this is another kind of cartoon representation where you can see that we can cover these pretty big areas with these. Um, and we're measuring, we're trying to figure out where those seizures are coming from. And so once we are um, recording, you can figure out, okay, maybe it's coming from this little group of electrodes here. And then we know that that's the area of the brain that's causing the seizures. Um, this is stereo EEG. So this is um, what we've been doing here since I arrived in 2018 for our depth electrodes. Um, this here is a picture of the robot that we use. So it's not, um, you know, when you think of a robot, you think of something that's going to walk into the room and say, good morning, Dr. Sharma, and ready to do your surgery. But it's, it's not quite like that. Um, it, the robot needs a lot of uh, assistance. So I, um, I use this robot. This is the one that we have. And it's kind of like a glorified uh, trajectory guide or drill guide. But it, it has the ability to kind of drive to a trajectory and, and, and put me right on target. And these are targets that I plan. So I, I usually spend several hours planning these out because I want to avoid blood vessels. I want to make this as safe as possible. Um, I need to make sure that when I'm putting those electrodes in, they're not going to hit each other. So they need to be um, a little bit far apart. They need to hit the target. Um, and you know the accuracy, like I said, is usually less than a millimeter. And so by doing this very precisely, um, this is a much safer procedure than what we used to do for depth electrodes. It's actually got a much lower complication rate than the subdural strips and grids where we actually had to do an operation and remove that window of bone. This actually gets done through tiny little holes in the skull. Um, they're smaller than the kind of eraser of a, of a pencil. They're more like um, a couple millimeters wide. Um, and you can see um, in this patient here, um, all you can see on the surface is, is where the little metal bolts that I use go into the skull and they come out. So this is very well tolerated. We, um, we have a patient in the ICU right now. Um, she's playing on her tablet, she's eating breakfast, and all the while we're recording, so she's hooked up. And actually the head's all wrapped up, um, and I'll show you a picture of that. 
So this is kind of what you see, you know, the, it doesn't look all that different than the electrodes that are just stuck on the scalp, but actually they're going through the skull and into the brain so we can record directly from those areas that we think the seizures are coming from. Uh, so once we've identified where the seizures are coming from, so say we're, we're successful, we've, um, you know, we've got our theory, we've put our electrodes in and we have figured out where the seizures are coming from. So ideally, we'd want to remove that area and hopefully cure the seizures. But we need to make sure that that's safe. So functional MRI is, is a good thing to look for function. Um, it's basically where you get someone to do a task, whether it's um, saying a word, or maybe tapping the finger, um, and then we can see what area of the brain is being activated by those tasks. Uh, and that will tell us how close we might be from, say, language or um, you know, the movement part of your brain. Because what we don't want to do is, you know, cure the seizures, but leave you with, you know, a bad side effect that might be permanent. Um, there's a WADA test um, to study speech and memory where you actually can kind of put one side of the brain to sleep temporarily um, so that you're only relying on the other side. And then you can see how much of your memory relies on one side versus the other, how much of your speech relies on one side versus the other. Um, now you need somebody really cooperative um, and often this will be, if it's done in kids, it would be older kids or more likely adults. Um, we have another way of mapping when we do our depth electrodes. So when I put in one of those electrodes into the brain, we can actually use that to map. We can send a little bit of current through that electrode to specific areas and stimulate it. And, and then our neuropsychologists will come and, and do an evaluation as that's happening. They might want you to count or, or talk. And if we've stimulated the area where speech is coming from, you would be having a normal conversation like this and all of a sudden stop. And we, if that happened, we would know that that was an area that was important for your speech, and we would not want to remove it. But we have other tools that we can use in those situations. Um, all our patients before they are um, considered for surgery get neuropsychological testing. We want to know, um, first of all, just what your baseline functioning is, because um, we want to know after surgery, we would like that to get better. We want to know that we're doing good things here. Um, but the other part of it is you may be normal across everything, but have one area where um, you have a, a problem with your processing or, or your maybe your memory or your speech. And oftentimes, you know, if everything else is normal and then there's one area that you're struggling in, it could be that that's where your seizures are coming from because that area is not working properly because it's constantly being disrupted by these seizures. So it's not only just um, something that we like to track, but it's actually helps us figure out where the seizures are coming from. Um, psychological evaluations, um, you know, uh, epilepsy is very closely associated um, with different mood disorders or psychiatric disorders, or even just, you know, general psychological disturbances. And so we really like to screen for this. We like to provide support for this. And we want to identify this before, you know, you're placed in this potentially stressful situation where you could be in hospital, potentially having surgery. Um, ophthalmology again. So want to test all these areas of the brain. If you have a problem with your vision, um, it could be that that's where your seizures are coming from. Vision is in the back of the head. Um, or if we're going to do a surgery where we expect that vision um, will be affected, we want to document if before surgery you already have an issue or if that's actually functioning properly. We want to be able to counsel you in terms of what to expect you know, what, what will change after surgery and, and what will likely not change. So you can make the best decision um, for yourself or for your child. Now, um, there's a lot of different types of epilepsy surgery. So I'll go through all these. Temporal lobectomy would be resecting the front part of the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is in blue in this little cartoon. Um, and extra temporal resections would be anywhere outside of that. Because the temporal lobe is the one that's been most studied um, and um, has the most literature on it um, and is the one we're, we're operating in the most often, um, it tends to have a higher rate of success than if you have a seizure focus outside of the temporal lobe. Um, there is something called MR lit. So this is laser ablation. So this is actually, instead of removing that focus that the seizures are coming from, 
I actually put a laser into it and, and burn it to destroy that area. Um, hemispherectomy, we've talked about a little bit initially. It's where I disconnect one half of the brain so that the seizures could be still happening there, but they won't actually travel to the good part, the functioning part of your brain. Corpus callosotomy is dividing something called the corpus callosum, which is this very, um, it's your biggest pathway that connects the two halves of the brain. And so it's not a full disconnection like the hemispherectomy, but this disconnects the major pathway. It's something that goes from the front all the way to the back. Um, and this is most um, helpful for drop attacks or atonic seizures where you just, you're standing, you're walking, you're fine, and then go down very hard. Um, that can be a super dangerous situation. Um, I have a, a child who's 14, but he's over six feet tall um, and he was having these. And when he would go down, it would sometimes be in the parking lot, even with a helmet, he would hurt himself. He'd fractured an arm. He'd um, fractured his... Sorry. Mm. Um, so yeah, so he had a corpus callosotomy. One second. All right. Oh, here we go, we're back. So um, he had a corpus callosotomy um, and those drop attacks stopped. So, you know, you can imagine his mom is now able to take him to a picnic. Um, she's able to leave the house without worrying that he's gonna fall down and hurt himself. Um, VNS, vagal nerve stimulation is where you have a stimulator that's implanted um, and it stimulates the vagus nerve in the neck. Um, that's actually a really useful thing for generalized epilepsy. So your seizures, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be coming from a specific area. That can be helpful. And then RNS, which is probably the newest technology we have to treat seizures, is responsive neurostimulation. And um, that is um, something where you need to have a focus that you've identified. But it's an option when you can't remove or burn that area because that area could be functional. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is temporal lobectomy. So this um, here shows kind of what, what's removed. Um, this is, again, a little cartoon of the brain, and this shows the temporal lobe. Um, this is a, a patient who's had this procedure done, and this is the, the scar or the incision that it leaves. It's always behind the hairline so that you can cover it up and... Um, you know, we, we try and be very sensitive to, you know, how things look. And I always want to make um, the patient happy. And, you know, this person had a, the whole area shaved, but sometimes I'll leave even a little bit of hair in the middle um, so that you could hide things easier. Um, it's the front part of the temporal lobe that we remove. And so we stay in front of normal and important structures on the left side, in particular language, which is kind of back further um, towards the back of the head from this, and we stay well in front of that. Um, this is after surgery where you can see the cavity where we resected that area fills with fluid, which is why it shows up as bright white on this scan here. Um, and this is a different way of looking at it where the water or the um, cerebrospinal fluid will show up as black. Um, and this shows the hippocampus being resected. That's that structure that's very commonly involved in seizures and it, um, also controls memory, but usually when it's generating seizures, it's um, not doing its full job at helping you with your memory. Um, but some patients do suffer memory problems after this, but by and large, um, actually I would have to say most patients do not. Um, this is an extratemporal resection. So this is again, like I said, it's anything outside the temporal lobe. Um, and um, Really, usually in these situations, you know, there's a lesion there. There's either a, a tumor or there's um, some kind of abnormality of the blood vessels that we're going after. Um, you know, it's, it's um, important to know your boundaries of this. And those electrodes that I place can often help with this. You want to define an area. Um, cortical dysplasia would probably be the most common. That's that 
malformation of the brain where you can really demarcate or you can kind of trace around a certain area um, and know that that's where the seizures are coming from. Um, this is a picture of the um, MR lit. So it's MRI guided laser interstitial therapy. It's quite a mouthful, but um, basically it's what I talked about. So you go um, to the operating room and again, using the robot, so it's very precise, I put this kind of guide, which is a, a bolt screwed into the skull. And then we go to the MRI suite um, and the patient would be asleep for this whole process. And in the MRI, we actually put this laser through that, that bolt that I screw in into the area of the brain, kind of like illustrated here on the bottom left, and then use the laser to burn that area where the seizures are coming from. And the, the thing about doing it in the MRI is that I can actually watch on the MRI screen in real time um, what my volume is that I'm burning so that I can be very precise in the area that I'm burning, avoid those important structures that are gonna be useful for you know, your day-to-day your -day, you know, movement, speaking, all that stuff, um, and just focus on the area that is generating the seizures. Um, and then um, the laser comes out. Um, most patients will stay in hospital for one night after this. And it's only done through a small little hole in the skull. Uh, we did our last, the last one of these was two weeks ago. The patient's doing well. Uh, hemispherectomy. So this is where I, I do the disconnection of an entire half of the brain. Um, here you can see the different cuts. This is something that takes all day. It takes about eight hours, 10 hours sometimes to do this because it's a very big operation. Um, and usually it would be done in somebody where that part of the brain was not working. Um, and often they've already transferred over a lot of the functions to the other side. So our patient um, who had this done in 2018, you know, she um, we already had a little bit of weakness on the opposite side of the body. So again, this side of the body controls the opposite side in terms of movement. Um, and you know, you, you may be surprised, but after we did this operation and she was seizure free, she actually didn't have any weakness on the other side of the body. She was talking to us, speaking normally. Um, you know, you can do this safely and you can do this without causing a problem if you choose the right person and if you do it in a very safe way. Um, and, and she's been seizure free, like I said, for I think it's three years now, um, which is amazing and life changing. Um, and, you know, these are all the cuts that we have to make to disconnect this. And basically, this part of the brain still stays there and, and it could still be generating seizures, but those seizures would not make their way to the functional part of the brain. And so they can just stay in isolation, like a little island, and they may still be seizing, but it can't affect you. Uh, corpus callosotomy, this is where I disconnect kind of the, the major highway between the two halves of the brain. So it's not a full disconnection, but it's kind of um, taking away that pathway. And this is the corpus callosum right here. So you can see it connecting the right hemisphere to the left right there. And this is a close up view. Um, this is what my view would be. This is done with the operating microscope. Um, and it's a thin band and it looks um, pearly white is how they describe it. So it's this um, white fibers, which are the connecting fibers between the two halves of the brain. And then I go and I disconnect it from the front all the way to the back. Um, this MRI here shows what the corpus callosum looks like before surgery. It's this dark gray band right here in the middle. And this is what it looks like after, where again, anything, anything that you remove from the brain fills with fluid. So here, this is bright white because that area has filled with fluid. And again, this is very good for those seizures where you, you go down really suddenly, drop attacks or atonic seizures. Um, vagal nerve stimulator, really, really useful. Um, you know how I said that sometimes you have generalized epilepsy where it starts everywhere all at once. Um, when we can't just take out one area because it's starting everywhere all at once. So we can put in a permanent implant called a vagus nerve stimulator. Here it shows you the little um, device here made um, in a pocket that I make on the chest. So it's almost like a pacemaker, the, the pocket here, except that the wires, instead of going to the heart, they actually go under the skin 
and they wind around this nerve in the neck called the vagus nerve. Um, and that nerve is a very long nerve. It actually starts in your brain, deep in your brain, and it travels down your neck and it goes to your heart and it goes to your guts. Um, and we take advantage of that because usually it's signaling from the brain down, but we signal up, we signal towards the brain and it tends to just dampen that seizure activity. Um, most patients, um, they say 60% will have a reduction of 50% or more. Um, and so while it's usually not a cure, um, that decrease can be, again, life-changing um, and um, really, really positive for the patient and their family. Um, it's automatic, so it will actually deliver impulses on its own, but the neurologist can program it to do different things. They can program it to try and detect automatically when you're having a seizure by your spike in your heart rate. So your heart rate goes up suddenly. Um, this can kick on, give you a little extra burst and try and again, stop those seizures. Um, there's also a, a magnet, so you can actually swipe over it um, and it'll give you a little extra boost. So if you see a seizure, um, you know, you can reuse the magnet and try and stop it. Um, this is what it looks like close up, and they're getting smaller and smaller, I will say. So this is the actual electronic device that generates the impulses. Um, and this is the wire that will go under the skin. And these are the tiny little wires that wrap around the nerve. So the ones that I use are two millimeters. These are all you know, really, really small. Um, and I you know, do this with operating loops, look like little telescopes on my glasses. Um, and then this is a neck um, dissection here where I find the nerve right there. Um, responsive neurostimulation. So this is kind of the latest and greatest. This is the, the newest technology that we have. Um, and it's actually really amazing because this has allowed us to give options to patients that would normally not have a surgical option. And um, for instance, say we did our, our um, SEG. So we put seizures inside the brain and we found out um, actually, it's not just coming from one temporal lobe, Why it's coming from both sides. And we can't take out both your temporal lobes. Yeah. You will not function properly. We can only take out one. Um, and even then, we can take it out safely if that's the side where your seizures are coming from and it's um, not um, working properly. She's talking about neuropathies? Neuropace, yes. Um, actually, do you mind muting your uh, your microphone there? So, um, so for instance, so say we've got both temporal lobes that are active. Um, so what I can do, because I can't resect both temporal lobes, is I can actually put electrodes, one on each side with this device into those hippocampi, the areas that are most active. And I hook it up to this stimulator that actually goes um, inside, um, kind of a, a hole made in the skull. And it's hooked up and it's constantly recording. It's trying to record seizures. And you kind of got to teach it. So you got to program it. And again, this is on the neurology side. I, I'm just the technician, I put it in. But the neurologists will program it to recognize your specific seizures and then deliver a stimulation to try and stop it. Um, and we've had some really good results with this. Um, the Neuropace team, when they've done all their research, um, they found 80% um, uh, decrease in seizures overall. So that's quite good. Um, this is what it looks like close up. So again, all these devices are pretty small. Um, and because I create a hole in the skull before I put it in, it's not like it sticks out. Um, once your hair grows back, you can't see it. So it's all very discreet. So in terms of our outcomes, so how, how good are we at actually curing these seizures? And I would say pretty good. Um, in the literature for anterior temporal lobectomies, it's 70 to 80% seizure free. Um, I am proud to say that when we looked at our recent outcomes, they were better than that. They were around 80 to 90%. Um, and so, you know, to be able to offer this, you know, is huge. And um, patients that don't become seizure free, and you know, it's not 100%, there are patients that don't become seizure free. Um, they've all, um, in my experience, had some improvement in their seizures. So even if you don't get seizure free, you know, which is obviously our goal, um, you will likely have a very significant decrease in seizures. 
Um, neocortical is always more difficult. Um, with a lesion, so with a vascular malformation, a low-grade tumor where we actually have something that we can see to go after, remove, outcomes are pretty good. The range is 50 to 80%. But again, I think if all the things line up, you know, we're, we're these detectives, we're, we're doing our investigations. If, if it, seizures look like they're coming from that area based on how they look, and the MRI shows an abnormality, and your EEG all localizes there, I think you're, that person, that patient would be looking at a kind of an 80% chance of seizure freedom. Um, without a lesion, obviously, when we're just you know, identifying an area that's been active on our EEGs or our depth electrode, but it doesn't look abnormal, the chances of seizure freedom there are going to be less. But again, um, you know, we could still make a big difference by decreasing how many seizures a patient is having. Hemispherectomy, 70 to 80% seizure free. Um, again, that's a life changing thing. Um, and, um, you know, the the patient that I, just, I keep talking about, you know, she um, she had some weakness before. Her her brain had already adjusted, and so really we didn't see any um, new weakness in her. But if we were to do this in somebody who was still completely functional, they would have weakness on the opposite side of the body, um, and and we know that that would happen. But the, that recovers over time because the brain has a remarkable ability to heal especially the younger you are. And most patients that would have this done would be left um, able to walk with that arm on the opposite side, um, moving, but the hand would probably be a more of a helper hand. So again, this is something that we really will counsel you very, very, um, very intensely on because it's important to know you know, what the gain is, but also what the risk is. And, and we help you with that. Um, corpus callosotomy, drop attacks, I would say it's very, very good at getting rid of those drop attacks. Um, you may still have seizures, but they would usually be smaller ones, um, and they wouldn't spread so quickly. Um, and um, often it means um, some of these kids don't need to go over the helmet all the time, because, you know, when you're not sure when you could just dropped suddenly on pavement, in the house, um, that's quite a dangerous situation. And so it really enables them to live a more normal life. Uh, VNS, so this is um, not usually a cure, but um, there are some patients that will become seizure-free with VNS. It's less than 10%. Um, but um, it's actually gone up, so 30 to 50%. But actually, in kids, um, it's now 60% that will have at least a 50% decrease. Um, other things parents will tell me is that the seizures are shorter, or maybe they're not as severe. Um, and certainly, it's um, helpful for peace of mind as well to know that you can set it up to have that stimulation that comes on when it detects the increase in heart rate. For instance, at nighttime, if somebody has a lot of nighttime seizures, and um, you know, as a parent, you might be sleeping, but to know that that device will kick in um, even at night um, when everyone's asleep to try and stop that seizure can be um, give you a lot of peace of mind. Uh, RNS we talked about, so this is again uh, responsive neural stimulation, um, and the device is called Neuropace. Um, so 75 to 80 percent reduction in seizures overall but 30% will have a better response than that. The reduction of seizures around 90%, which is huge. And then there's about a third of patients that will have six months of seizure freedom. And you know that can be a really nice thing to just have that break. And this takes some time because we need to learn what the seizures are looking like um, and, and program it appropriately. But so far, um, we've had really good results with our kids. Um, there's actually a low rate of complications with surgery. So I know that it's probably one of the biggest fears that people have that they will go for surgery and they will wake up um, a different person with a, a bad uh, complication. Maybe they can't move. It's actually not the case. You know, we, we counsel you on um, the risks and there's always a, some risk with any surgery, infection, bleeding, anesthesia. Um, but, you know, the chance of actually something unexpected happening is usually quite low. 
Um, and we get our patients through these um, usually without complications like this. And the majority of time, if there is going to be a loss of function, it is something that we are able to counsel you about beforehand. Um, you know, if I'm disconnecting a whole hemisphere, like I said, if that other side is functional, there will be some weakness there, the vision on that side as well. Um, so, you know, we, we talked to you about this, but, you know, it's unlikely that there'll be something that we didn't expect that happened. So in conclusion, um, not all parent, patients with refractory epilepsy are surgical candidates, but in general, patients with focal, meaning it comes from one specific spot, refractory epilepsy are candidates for surgery. Um, now, the exception to this obviously is the VNS, which can be done for generalized epilepsy as well. Um, and actually corpus callosotomy would be considered a treatment for general, generalized epilepsy. Um, but multiple steps are required before um, your doctor, but it's actually our team, before our team concludes that you're a surgical candidate. And I think that's the other important thing and, and why we're, we're doing so well here with our outcomes is that we really take a team approach. We present every one of these patients at our epilepsy meeting where I'm there, there's another neurosurgeon that helps me with these. Um, there's the neurologist, the neuropsychologist, the radiologists, our social workers. Um, we all meet together and we discuss these things and we, we show all the evidence before we decide that you are a candidate. And then we meet again to decide what, what type of surgery might be best for you. It is very much a team approach and we, we feel like we're detectives where we're trying to gather information um, and, and really just best figure out where those are coming from, what we can do about it. Um, you might be a good surgical candidate, but a resective procedure might not be possible. So maybe I can't remove it um, if it's close to an area of the brain that's important for, say, movement or speech. Um, but now we have other options for that. For instance, RNFs, NeuroPACE. Um, and so, you know, there are very few patients that make it all the way to kind of the surgical decision point um, that we are not able to offer anything to these days. Thank you. This is where I spend my time when I'm not doing epilepsy surgery. It's in the mountains in this beautiful, beautiful place. <laughs> Thank you so much.